I hear that. Hey, we've got a few uh, announcements for you that we're going to get into here in a second. But I just want to say we are so glad to see every single one of you this morning, especially coming out with all the humidity and whatnot. Uh, talking to God's power earlier this morning, he was saying, man, uh, we don't have humidity in Mississippi, but it gets a whole lot hotter <laughs> where he's from. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's one way to be grateful for humidity, right? <laughs> Anyways. So, uh, I want to bring something to y'all's attention, uh, Pastor Kevin is asking too, and some of y'all may already be aware of this, but the uh, day before yesterday, uh, some communities up north of Mississippi experienced some, uh, some tragedies with some uh, storms that came through, and so uh, the, uh, the, the commission that we're a part of is putting together uh, some relief uh, packages to take up there. Uh, and we've got some different things that they're looking for. Um, what is, do you want me to go to the oldest? Quickly. Quickly. <laughs> All right. So, uh, they, what they're asking for, uh, and we can reiterate this to you later, is gift cards uh, to Walmart, the Dollar General, plastic storage totes, pet food, diapers uh, for children and adults. Uh, baby wipes, disinfecting wipes, large garbage bags, laundry detergent. Uh, and if anybody has any of these things, these have been specifically asked for. Uh, power tools, paper towels, hand sanitizer, parts, toilet paper, shampoo, uh, conditioner, body soap, all that good stuff, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, towels, feminine products, diapers, all those things. Uh, if you are able to uh, help with any of those things, just bring them here. To the office. Uh, we're going to be taking them out to Providence Baptist Church on Tuesday. No, we'll take them tomorrow. We're we'll taking them tomorrow, excuse me. So uh, try to bring it sometime uh, tomorrow uh, so we can get it out there in time for it to be uh, sent up to those people who are in need. Uh, some other announcements that we have today at four there's choir rehearsals. So if you uh, want to be a part of the choir, if you already are, don't forget about that. Today at 5, we have D groups again, which is a great time to go deeper into our Sunday morning message, and I want to invite all of y'all to come out to that. Uh, and then today at 6, we have time of prayer, which is just an awesome time of uh, seeking the Lord and, and, and lifting up the things that we want to see uh, in happen in this community. So if you never came and been a part of that, uh, you'll truly be blessed and, and to see what the Lord does through that. Uh, Saturday, April 1st, we have our... Uh, monthly Ironman's Breakfast at 8.30 a.m. featuring our own Pastor Kevin who's going to be speaking. Uh, so men, if you uh, are able to get up early, come join us please. It's great food and great fellowship. Uh, that same day at 1 o'clock we have the Children's Extra Awesome Fellowship. Uh, so if you have kids or grandkids um, or if you just like a good egg hunt, please come out. <laughs> Um, let's see. And then the next day is uh, April 2nd, which is Palm Sunday. Uh, and we will feature our Easter musical, uh, Jesus Paid It All. So please uh, invite your family and your friends to come and join us for that. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk to people personally that when we have these kind of uh, programs and things like that, um, and that was the first time encountering us as a, as a church and, and and it really uh, just it, it encouraged them to, to come and to be a part of the church. So invite people that you know don't go to church. All right, and then last but not least, Sunday, April 23rd through April 26th, again, our Fresh Fire Firm Foundation Preaching Bible Conference. Uh, we want to invite all of you to be there. Again, you can invite people uh, and we want you to, but uh, this is Preaching and Bible Conference. It's a revival, and that's for us as a church, right? So, uh, this morning, I want to share with you a scripture from Psalm 57, starting in verse 7. It says this, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will wake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be, all, be over all the earth. Let's exalt the Lord this morning. Let's Amen. praise Him. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and I thank you for everyone that's here under the sound of my voice, Lord. God, I pray that you just bless them. God, and use them to be a blessing this morning. Help us to worship you with freedom, God. Let's offer up our hearts and everything that we have to you this morning. God, we pray that uh, through the service you be glorified, God, that we'll be able to grow closer to you through the knowledge of your word. God, we're so grateful for everything you've done and everything that you're doing. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey man, everyone. Hello, how are you? Let's stand, please. This is truly the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Turn around, tell your neighbor, say hello. It's good to be in the house of the Lord once again as we sing Victory in Jesus.
it's in you, Lord, it's in you, it's in you, my life, it's in you, Lord, my strength, it's in you, Lord, my hope, it's in you, Lord, it's in you, it's you, I will praise you with all I am Mary Magdalene. Magdala was a thriving populous place with textile industries and dye works. Because of my connections with these industries, I was a woman of means. I suffered from a neurological disorder that left my hair disheveled, glaring eyes, and sunken cheeks. The moment Jesus saw me, he commanded my nerve-wracked mind to be healed. Because of his spiritual and physical well-being for me, I was forever grateful. Along with the other women in Jesus' company, I greatly aided Jesus as he traveled from place to place, proclaiming his message. There were many details to take care of for Jesus and for his disciples' personal comfort and well-being. I followed Jesus on that last sad journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. I was present when the religious leaders clamored for his blood. I listened as Pilate pronounced his death by crucifixion. I wept as he was spat upon and ill-treated by the crowd. I saw him nailed to the cross. I stood with the other women comforting him. I was there until he died. I was present when Jesus was buried in the tomb. Early the next morning, I went to the tomb. It was empty. I rushed to tell the others. They ran to the tomb and saw it was empty. They went home, but I stood there weeping. Two angels asked me why I was weeping, so I told them of my missing Lord. When I turned away from the tomb, I saw a figure, perhaps the gardener, 
He asked me why I was weeping. When I told him, he spoke my name. Instantly, I knew it was the Lord. He told me not to touch him, but to go and tell the others. I ran to tell the others that I had seen the risen Lord. Amen. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This next hymn I'm going to sing is, I Must Tell Jesus. Listen at the words as we sing, and sing along with us as we sing this great song. Tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make all my troubles quickly and in. Yes, I. Jesus alone. Oh. 
the king comes through the gate. Oh, the king is coming. Yes, the king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see. Yes, oh, Those who lie. 
have been redeemed broken homes that he has mended those from prison he has freed little children and the aged hand in hand stand all aglow who were crippled broke it ruining glad in garments white as snow yes all oh, the king is coming yes the king is coming I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face his face I see oh the king is coming yes the king is coming praise God he's coming for me I can hear the chariots rumble I can see the marching throng the flurry of God's trumpets spells the end of sinning wrong regal robes are now unfolding heaven's grandstands all all in place heaven's choir is now a symbol start to sing amazing grace oh the king is coming yes the king is coming i just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face his face i'll see in the chorus. Lead us in the chorus. Yes, oh, the King is coming. Yes, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I'll sing. Good morning to you. It's a delight to see you on this day. Let me invite you to John 17, please. John 17. We're going to read the first five verses. Uh, there be no PowerPoint this morning. Uh, stand, if you will, please. 
This is the word of God. The word says this. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. As you have given him all authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself that the glory which I had with you before the world was. Beloved Father, thank you that soon the Lord Jesus Christ will come again. We pray that he comes quickly. Lord, this morning, This morning, I sense in our midst an unholy spirit. But I know the Lord of glory. And I know that in Jesus' name, we have victory. And in the name of the Lord Jesus now, I demand that this unholiness depart from this place. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that the spirit of violence and hatred and lust would be driven out. Make yourself known today. Bind the evil one. Send him away. And let no spirit but the Holy Spirit have sway in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. As I studied for this message today, I decided I would take a look at what other men titled the message. I mean... This passage, all of John 17, is so rich and how I wished I could touch all of it and I'm afraid I won't be able to, but I'm going to try to give you at least a sample of it, if you know what I mean. John Dunn called, or John, Ron Dunn called his message uh, on this passage, the prayer of all prayers. Adrian Rogers Adrian Rogers called it the greatest prayer ever prayed. Andrew Telford called it a pattern for believers. All of these titles tell us something, and I looked at it, and I saw this, and I examined it, and I decided that the best title I could give it are the first words of Jesus in this first verse, the hour has come. This is the third part and the final part of the final instructions before we take Jesus to the cross in the narrative that we have in Scripture. These are his words. He's at the point of going into the garden. He's made it to the edge of the garden by the time he voices this prayer. He's looking upward. He lifted his eyes. Y'all ever do that when you pray? Or do you do what uh, they taught me when I was a little boy? Now fold your hands, and close your eyes, and bow your head. Is that how you were taught? That's how it's taught. And so sometimes it's just not easy for me to open my eyes and look up to the Lord because I was indoctrinated with that. Nothing wrong with either one. I just want you to know that there's more than one way to pray. And the Lord lifted his eyes and he prayed. And he shared these things with us. And I want to take you in, into four truths this morning. And 
And we'll look at these, and the first one is celebration, the second one is intercession, the third one is anticipation, and then finally culmination, the king is coming. Culmination, glory to God. That's what we're going to learn. So let me take you through these, if I may, for just a few moments, and I'll just tell you up front in the flow of this outline, I'm going to spend more time on the first point, just a little time on the second point, crank it back up on the third point, and then close it out with the fourth one here. This outline is going to ebb and flow like the ocean. You see the tide, the waves come in, and then it pulls back out, and then it comes in again. That's how I envision what God has written in this passage and what he's shown me today. <coughs> Excuse me. So first, celebration, if you will, in these first five verses that we have read. You know, there's a word of victory in here. Father, the hour has come. These words are a victory cry. More than once, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to suffer many things by the hands of men. He would do that, and he would die, but that he would rise again. If you also read in those passages where he said that, the disciples couldn't understand it. They didn't understand a single thing he said. In fact, we know that after the resurrection, when Mary, where'd Mary go? There she is. When Mary came with the news, they didn't want to believe her. They thought she'd gone nuts, hysterical. Can't believe this. Well, you know, the hour has come. It's victorious. I want to tell you something. When you walk in the Word and you walk in the will of the Father, even what you have not yet seen or experienced is as good as done. I was telling somebody the other day as I prayed for them and uh, I talked with them, I said, I'm praying for so-and-so, but the Lord has not yet brought me to the place where my pleas can turn into praise and thanksgiving. And that person said, what are you talking about? I said, you will reach the place in your prayer time when you're praying for something to happen that God will show you this is going to be and you can begin to thank him for what he's about to do. And the Lord Jesus is there. The hour has come. He knew that there was going to be victory. He knew there was another fight in Gethsemane yet to come. But he knew that he would pour out his soul unto death, but God would raise him from the dead. He knew the victory was his. We sang about that today, that we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you know it here? <coughs> That's my question. Do you know it here? Or do you just know it here? Too many times I understand it here, and it doesn't make it to my heart. That's a faith problem, ladies and gentlemen. When you're not listening to the Word of God, that's what happens to us in our hearts and in our lives. So he gave us, that was loud. So he gave us, he gave us this word of victory. Then he speaks of authority. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having a fun time today with my voice and my throat. In verse 2, he says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Wow. <coughs> the authority is the Lord's. In fact, what did he say in the Great Commission? All authority has given to me, been given unto me in heaven and on earth. That's why when you pray, you should pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why you present his name. <coughs> you pray to the Father. You pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you pray, you do that, the Lord hears you. But not just that. When you share the gospel, 
Tell them about Jesus. You say, of course you tell them about Jesus. Now, hold on just a minute. We spend a whole lot of time when we're trying to share the gospel. We want to soften the blow sometimes. So we talk a whole lot about what he did for us. And we talk about us and not very much about him. We need to reverse that and talk a whole lot about him and a very little bit about us. <coughs> when I share with people how to share the gospel, is my microphone even working? No? It's on now. My fault. When I share, ladies and gentlemen, poor Dan and poor Sean are up there jiggling the controls and I teach people. Patrick don't like what I'm saying. He left. <laughs> I teach people when you share your testimony, keep it under two minutes long. If you can't tell people in two minutes, in two minutes time, how you were saved, then you need to work on that. You need to get it under two minutes to tell people how you were born again. Because the focus is not you. The focus is the Lord Jesus Christ. The authority is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The third word he gives us is the word eternity. In verse 2, at the end of it, and in verse 3, he tells us this. This is eternal life, verse 3, that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Verse 3 explains verse 2, by the way, where Jesus said, I give them eternal life. This is the explanation. Eternal life, ladies and gentlemen, is to know the Father through the Son. Now the word know... I ask you that question, do you know Jesus? The word no is an intimate word, ladies and gentlemen. We often say we know someone, but we don't spend any time with them. None whatsoever. We don't know their families. We don't know their ways. We don't know many of their friends. We just really and truly know about them. And there are a whole lot of people. I was listening to Billy Graham Friday. Um, maybe it was yesterday. Is time ever a blur for y'all? And uh, I was listening just a short clip. I think it was yesterday, as a matter of fact. And he was talking about the churches in a Gallup poll. You know, Billy Graham, this was one of his old broadcasts. You can listen to him on XM Radio, though, on the Billy Graham station. About 467, I think, is the number. Something like that. And uh, he was talking about a Gallup poll that said 40% of Americans call themselves evangelicals, born-again Christians. The number is far less than that by the way, now. They call themselves that. The number is far less than 40%. And the fact of the matter is, of that 40%, there are a whole lot don't act like they ever met Jesus in their life. They know about Jesus. They heard about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They don't know anything about it. To know the Lord is to be intimately related to the Lord intimately related to the Lord. If someone asks you if you know the Lord, what they're asking you is, do you have a personal relationship with the Lord? Well, there's a fourth word I want to give you in this first part here that, I, that I'm moving through and taking my time with intentionally, and that is productivity. Look at verse 4 of the passage of Scripture. I've glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. What words to say at that moment? Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet. He hasn't been to Gethsemane yet. He hasn't sweat drops of blood yet. He's not worn the crown of thorns. He hasn't given his sinless back 
to men with whips and canes and rods who beat him without mercy. He hasn't suffered the wrath of God for our sins. So how can he say, I have finished the work? How can he tell us this? Part of the work of the Lord Jesus, part of it was to make known, make the Father known to the disciples. And this has been done. He's let them know. These men, I have to tell you something, they're almost as thick-headed as I am, really and truly. It took Jesus three and one-half years of teaching before they finally got it, before they finally said, John 14, oh, now we got it. Really, Jesus says, paraphrase, really? You got it now? But that's how we are, ladies and gentlemen. At least that's how I am. Jesus says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Isn't that right? Oh, but wait a minute. How's it going with your work? I'm craving the day, well, I personally am praying for the rapture of the church, and I do that quite often, but I... I, when that day comes, whether it's the rapture or whether they lay me down inside a, 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 a hole in the ground, either way, I want to be able to say that I finished the work, that I've done what the Lord brought me here to do. Are you doing the work of the Lord? Are you doing it? Are you created? Are you doing what the Lord created you for? Good works. That's what he said. You're created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works. Let me ask you something. Are you involved in the work of prayer? Are you? Are you involved in that? Why? Did you know I went to Peru this morning? Did y'all know that? I sure did. I was down there and, and uh, I was in, I was in uh, a number of different cities. I was over in the jungle. I was down in southern Peru. I was in Lima. I was all over the place in my prayer time. I went to Brazil. I went to England. Last week I was in Vermont. And I think it was Bristol, Tennessee. Could have been Bristol, Virginia, same city. Last Sunday morning. When you are involved in the work of prayer, you're involved in the work of the Lord in other places. Did you know that? Or do you only pray for yourself? How is it with you? How does it go for you? Are you involved in the work of proclamation? I mentioned sharing the gospel just a few moments ago. Are you doing that? When we come up next Sunday, next Sunday, April 2nd it is, in the afternoon at, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, are you going to show up and be a part of proclaiming the gospel to this area, to this city? Are you going to do that? Do you share with others in other times, in other places? Are you involved in the work of personal preparation by studying the Word of God? I read about a lady, 90 years old. I saw her yesterday, a video of her. And this 90-year-old woman was sitting there singing a praise song. Don't have a clue what the song was, never heard it in my life. But it's beautiful. Coming from her 90-year-old lips and heart. And her hand raised to the air, singing hallelujah. Must not have been Baptist. She had her hand raised. And uh, she's singing hallelujah. And her hallelujahs to the Lord and praise to God. And her daughter, who had posted that video, said, This dear saint of God has read through Scripture 66 zero times. Are you prepared by studying the Word of God. The Word of God says, study to show yourself approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Equipped for every good work. All the rest of it requires two things. Time before the Lord, time in the Word of God. 
Those things right there. These, these are your things that you must do. These are the good works the Lord has told us to be involved in, among others, ladies and gentlemen, that we don't have time to mention. There's another word I want to give you this morning. It's the second uh, in this. Not only did we have celebration, there's the word intercession. In the middle of this passage, 6 through 19, there's a lot of truth that I simply don't have time to walk through in one single message. And we would do well to learn to pray for one another as Jesus prayed for the disciples in this particular passage of Scripture. We would do very well to learn to do that. Why? The first word that we have in here is the word security. I've manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. They've known all the things, that all things which you have given me are from you. I've given to them the words which you have given me and received from and have known surely that I came forth from you and believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I pray for them. Skip down to verse 10. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Ladies and gentlemen, in Christ Jesus, you have security. Somebody asked Jerry Vines one time, do you believe in the perseverance of the saints? He said, no, sir, I don't. Well, that shocked everybody in the room, just like some of y'all looking up at me right now. He said, I believe in the perseverance of the Savior. It's the Lord who can keep us. That's where the keeping power is, ladies and gentlemen, because it's left up to you and me. We're going to flop. We are going to do it. I went fishing the other day. You know, uh, y'all remember Carlina? Uh, played our piano a number of years ago. Well, Carlina and her husband and daughter were here, and they stayed with us uh, during spring break during that week. And, and uh, she said, one thing I want to do is go fishing. She's a country girl through and through. And she said, I want to go fishing. I said, all right. So we went fishing. Went and bought night crawlers. Those are the most expensive things you can ever want to find anywhere. We bought night crawlers because I didn't want to get the little skinny worms. I wanted a real worm. And we went out to a pond, and I couldn't. As soon as I'd put the worm, I had to bait their hooks, man. As soon as I put the worm on the hook, they'd drop it in the water. They'd catch catfish. And I'd take the thing off. And bait another one, and they'd catch catfish. I barely had time to wet my own hook. I was so busy taking theirs and, and Michael's off the Michael City Boy. He hadn't been, that's the third time he'd ever been fishing. Man, he loved catching those things. Didn't know what to do with them, but he loved catching them. It was a blast. They enjoyed every bite of those two. Why am I telling you this? I don't remember. I had a reason for it. I did. Oh, this is why. Those catfish looked at that worm and that hook and they said, Oh, supper. And they went and grabbed it. And they ate it. And you and I are just like those catfish. So the first little worm comes along. We go grabbing for it. That's why our security is in the keeping power of Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's another word he gives us in here about them. Verses 11 through 13, as he shares this, he tells us these. Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I, came, I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I'm going to talk more about unity in just a moment, but it's a natural product, ladies and gentlemen, of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Third word I want to give you in this section is the word purity. In this word purity, 
he tells us the Lord Jesus as he prays and as he intercedes. And these are three things you can pray for, for one another, security, unity, and purity. He says it again, I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I'm giving you a whole lot there in there, reading a lot of that, and your minds are swimming. I can just kind of see, I can see those vapors swirling above your heads right now. This is what the Word of God is telling us. We need to live and think as though we are separated set apart for the purpose of God. It's the word purity that I'm giving you. I do not believe that we take the call to sanctification as seriously as we must take that word. I believe we're resting too much in the keeping power of Jesus and we're saying, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, it does matter. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to matter in your heart what you've done. There is a heresy out there. Tolerance of all things. And that has softened our hearts towards sin. And it's even hit the pulpit. And the pulpit, preachers are afraid to preach the truth of the Word of God. Y'all, if I ever act like I'm afraid to tell you sin is sin, please come tap me on the shoulder. Amen? I'm serious. Because I don't want to lose that fear of God. I don't want that rather than the fear of man. But there's this thing out there, it's called jamming, where we are jammed with this demand to celebrate and accept sin to the point that even in the pulpit, the preacher will say, well, you know, I love all people. And they'll soften it as they go along in their preaching. And then they will gradually slip in, but this is not right. We do that. Ladies and gentlemen, sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. Holiness is holiness. Keep that in mind. Do not lose that thought. Do not lose it. We're too soft in our hearts towards sin. The doctrine of holiness still matters. Now, I'm not talking about moralism. Even a Buddhist can be moral. Holiness is separated for the purpose of God. That's what it is in our lives. And Jesus prayed these things for them. Security, unity, and purity. I have another I want to share with you. Um, and I'm moving quickly through these. I realize that is the word anticipation. We have the word celebration, intercession, and now anticipation. In verses 20 through 23, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me. 
This is what the Lord says to us. It should bring to us a sense of awe, ladies and gentlemen, that the Lord Jesus Christ, it should bring this to you. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ was praying for you. Praying for you. Praying for you. Praying for you. The Lord Jesus himself anticipated this. He prayed for your eternity. Now this may sound like I just came out of left field for somebody present, but God wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. In fact, some of you here are so sorry you don't want to be saved. You don't care about it. I'm not woofing you on that, to quote Bo. I'm not. Some of you do not want to be saved. You're happy right where you are in your sorry self and sin. And you don't want to be saved. But I know this, that God loved you so much, he sent his only son that you could be saved. And the Lord Jesus prayed for you. He wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. And God wants to show you his love more than you want his love. He does. The Lord prayed for glory to be evident in us. Not our glory, but his glory. Can I tell you, it's just a little after 10 right now. Let me tell you what's about to happen down at uh, Baton Rouge. My son-in-law is about to be baptized. Amen. Now, he came to the Lord uh, a few years ago, but he's never been baptized as a believer. And he called me on the phone, and he says, I don't want this to be about me. I said, you don't worry. It's not going to be about you. <laughs> it's going to be about Jesus, every bit of it. And I said, in fact, I'll help you with that. And I, I gave him an, a suggestion of how he could pray and make sure this all was about the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's what he did. That's what Jesus did. He's praying for glory in your life, not your glory. We think we're so self-important, ladies and gentlemen. We ain't nothing. It's all about Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. Not our efforts, but him working through us. And then the Lord prayed for our unity, that they may be one. Whew, that good, isn't it? Now, did you know there are three basic levels of unity that the Lord has shown us? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to reference them. You can look it up, see if I'm right or wrong later on. If I'm wrong, come tell me. But I'm probably going to tell you, you're wrong for thinking I'm wrong in this case, because I know I'm right. I mean, it's the Word of God. There's the unity of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. The very moment you come to Christ, you become united with other believers, don't you? Isn't that good? Ha! That is so good how the Lord does that in our lives. The unity of the Spirit. You've walked through them all and other places, and you have sensed that person's a believer. I know you have. And that's the witness of and the unity of the Spirit in our heart. We don't have to develop unity, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to do that. A basketball team has to develop unity so that they can work as one. But we don't have to because it's a natural byproduct of knowing the Lord. Do you say, don't you mean supernatural? No, sir. A man who's in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The natural life of the Christ follower is a life of unity. And when you're out of unity, you're abnormal. You're unnatural. It's that simple. Then there's the unity of ministry. That's why God gave the gifts that he gave. The, the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. That's why he gave those is for the unity of ministry. To equip us for the work of the ministry. That's why he did it. And finally, there's the unity of faith. We all grow at different rates. All of us do. 
And over time, as you walk in the Spirit, when you walk in the Spirit, you walk in His unity, and you walk in His ministry. As we walk in the Spirit, we eventually come to the place where we have unity of faith. That's good. I got to hurry. The last word of this day is the word culmination. At the end of the chapter, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. The day is coming. where everything will culminate with the coming king. <coughs> he didn't ask me. I'm telling you, Holy Spirit does this. Started out singing victory in Jesus. My first point, victory. Ended up singing about culmination. My last point, the coming of the king. King is coming. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout a song of victory. And if I can shout with my broken voice, you can take yours that's not broken. You can shout too. Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, bless us. Make this be your time. Show us your strength, your greatness, your glory in Christ Jesus. Our risen Lord, our victorious Lord, our righteous Savior. Your name is blessed. If you need Christ this morning, if you've never trusted him, and you come tell me, today I need Jesus in my heart. I need to know how to be saved. And one of these men or women here will show you how you can be born again. You just come during this song we're about to sing. And the Lord, the Lord, I'm telling you, if you call on his name in truth from your heart, he'll save you. He's good like that. Some of us need to turn these steps into a place of prayer. We need to have a fresh encounter with the Lord. The Lord's already prayed for you. You come before him. Father, this is your invitation. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and do business with God. Come
Well, amen. amen. I can tell you the Lord did not want, the Lord did, the devil did not want this service to happen today. I promise you that. You be praying for victory in the second service with our Hispanics, please. Pray for that. Now, very soon, I'm not sure when we're going to be able to coordinate this out, but I want the Vermont team to share a report to the church in one of our morning services very soon. I got to hear from you guys. I just absolutely must hear what God did and how the reaction was to 30 inches of snow <laughs> to some of the ones who were present. So, um, very, very good time. Uh, Jim, in fact, why don't you come? I want you to give thanks for our offering this morning. This is part of our worship, sharing, sharing what with, with the Lord, giving back to the Lord, some of which he's given to us. I want you to do that today and look forward to it. As you've already heard, 5 o'clock we have D groups. I hope to see you then. And we'll pray afterwards in a time of prayer. Brother Jim. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so very much for the blessings you've given us. Uh, you're just so good to us. Uh, we have things that happen, the things that happened in our storm in Mississippi, but we have things that happen in our lives. And oh, I'm so grateful that you're there for us, that you made us to worship you, to love you, and that you do take care of us. Now we want to ask you to receive what we're about to give you, Lord. Uh, it's only a very, very small part of what you've blessed us with. But please accept our tithes and our offerings. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things to you in Jesus' name, just as you ask. Amen.